There we go. Yay, hey everybody. Welcome to another workshop here at Women Build Web 3. Today we have a really amazing guest who I know you guys have all been super looking forward to seeing this workshop. And I personally have been looking forward to checking out this workshop. Uh, if you're here, drop a GM in the chat. And we're just going to go ahead and kick this off with some questions from the server. So remember, as always, you can post questions in workshop Q&A and the ones that get the most thumbs up will get asked. Um, so before we get into questions, I'll just let Lee introduce himself and tell you guys a little bit about himself. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, GM, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Lee. I'm the VP of Developer Experience at Vercel. And we're the creators of Next.js, and I'm super excited to be here today and, and talk to you all about Next.js and give a little introduction. Awesome. Okay, cool. Let's just kick off with these questions. So the first question, well, these, so the, they have a list. These are kind of all related, so I'm just going to ask them all at once, and then you can kind of parse through them. So one, are you interested in Web3? What do you think is the most exciting or interesting thing about it? This is from Naomi. Yeah. So I think the thing that's most interesting to me about Web3 is the decentralization aspect of it. Um, specifically, as it relates back to the work that we're doing at Vercel, it's very interesting to me because the, the web is disproportionately uh, fast in certain areas and also centralized in certain areas. Like there's a lot of the web that goes through uh, US East 1 and the experience of folks on the web is not uh, equally equally distributed across the world. So my one of my passions is trying to help that become more decentralized and also fast for everyone all around the world. Um, and that's manifested itself in a lot of different ways, I think, in the Web3 community. But um, the underlying decentralization of it is, is definitely interesting. Okay, cool. Next question. Why do you think so many Web3 projects are built on Next? Do you think Next.js and React are the best options out there if you want to build a quality dApp, both for users and for the developers building the dApp? Yeah, I've noticed that like the, at the, the larger level, React is probably the most popular way of building web applications today. And for, for folks who are wanting to, to get started and, and build projects, not only for new companies, but also just for learning and their own personal benefit, it's such a good skill to have because it can translate to future job opportunities or help them advance their career. So when they look towards React, Next.js is the way that's helping them get started really quickly. And I'll, I'll go more into this, of course. Um, but then also, too, when working, with, um, when working with wallets, for example, you want to make sure you're doing it in a secure way. You don't want to let somebody compromise a wallet. And to do that, it's it's a lot more difficult or sometimes impossible to do that only in the browser or on the client side. You need to have a server that allows you to you know, use a private key or connect to uh, an, an API or an account somewhere and securely uh, fetch information. And to do that, that's one of the things that Next.js provides, which is giving you that server um, with your React application so you can securely you know, connect to your wallet, for example. So I think that's one big reason. Also, we try to invest a lot in, in helping out the community, you know, whether it's individual builders or, or people just getting started. And I think that helps folks feel like they can use our technology and kind of get started quickly. Awesome. And then this one, maybe you'll go over in a second when you do your workshop, but someone had a question around um, like private keys and API keys and how those are managed with Next.js. And, and really the question is, um, so we've been using an RPC provider named Infura, and over the course, we teach people how to paste in their project ID and kind of how to make their next app communicate. So could you talk a little bit about how that's protected and how, just how that works? Yeah, I'll talk about it quickly, and then I'll also try to show a demo when I pull up the code. But basically, um, Next.js uses a standard, which is this .env file. You might have seen this in um, create React app or some of the other web frameworks if you've used them before. But it allows you to define these keys inside of um, different files, files, whether it's like a local version or a production version. And for Next.js specifically, by default, keys are only on the server. So you can't ever expose that key into the browser and have it be compromised, right? But 
if you're using a value that you want to explicitly let the client side access, so use it in the browser, like in your React code, then you can prefix it with next underscore public. And that's going to tell Next.js, hey, I'm, I'm intentionally making this value available to the browser. It's not something that's like a secure uh, write token for my API. Maybe it's a read only token that has scope down permissions, for example, and I'm okay with, with putting that there. So we give you those tools to help you make that decision. Great. Okay. Yeah. And, and hopefully I think Lisa is going to go over this and what this actually looks like in practice in a bit. And then a question from the audience that we have kept forgetting to ask other people, but now they pointed it out. They're like, you never ask our question. Um, Crystal wants to know, does Lee wash his legs in the shower? I don't know where this joke originated. I don't know if it's from, so I think I know there was this video, I think on YouTube or TikTok or something where it was revealed that a lot of people don't like scrub their legs. They're just like, oh, the the down, you know, the down run from the water from like your upper body just cleans them. So now everyone's interested to know, do you actually scrub or do you just let the water kind of run with soap and clean? <laughs> that is hilarious. I have a, uh, what's it called? A loofah? Is that yeah. the word for it? Yeah, that's what I use. You gotta, you gotta scrub the legs, you know? Honestly, this is good. <laughs> Bonus points. <laughs> We're here. We stand uh, clean, clean we people. We <laughs> stand clean people. We stand a clean uh, director of uh, developer relations and experience. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. And then one more question. So, oh, two questions. Um, if you had to pick another library or framework besides Next to build a Web3 project, what would you pick and why? So, the other library that I've been using quite a bit lately is SvelteKit, which a lot of people really like. It's um, There's some things that will feel very familiar for React developers and then some other things that are way, uh, way different, I guess. Some argue that it's a lot easier or simple. Others like taking advantage of the React ecosystem. I'd encourage you to check it out though because it, it helps you challenge your existing knowledge of React and how to build web applications. And it might give you some, some new perspective on building for the web. So spell kit's cool. Got it. Go. So that's something that's been on my list. Maybe a question from me, actually, as someone who does developer relations and who's been here a long time, a lot longer than me, how do you deal with like the constant mental strain of learning so many new things? Like, I feel like there's so many things I want to learn and there's so many things that I do learn but there's also so many things that I don't end up having time to learn. So how do you like deal with that? And, and for example, for something like SvelteKit, how long did it actually take you to get around to using it? Yeah, I think one skill that's really valuable for people doing DevRel is the ability to look at these new technologies and not necessarily learn every facet of them or go super deep on them. But let's say you want to spend maybe a couple of days building a small application, building just something to, to try the basics, to try the, the main concepts and just get an understanding of what the value is. Um, I, I think that's my general approach of how I tackle, you know, some of these new libraries or frameworks is I want to try to build something and it doesn't need to be uh, really large and take a ton of time, just enough for me to kind of understand why the creators decided that this was different or a better option than some of the other things that existed. And if I really like it, then maybe I'll go a little bit deeper and, and you know, spend a little bit more time on it. But yeah, it's, it's tricky because there's tons of great tech coming out all the time. So you have to be really intentional about where you want to focus. And, and now in my role now, I have a, a team of wonderful people who are all interested in different things. So we have some people on the team who really love you know, Svelte and Nuxt. And we have some people on the team who really love React and some people, other stuff too. So I'm able to hear from them as well. Mm. Okay, thank you for sharing that. And now I'm going to just go ahead and hand it over to you. I will be in the background, but now Lee's going to take over and teach us about building front ends with Next.js. And uh, if you need anything, I'll be here, Lee. Awesome. Cool. Well, I will share my screen and we'll just, uh, we'll just kick things off here. I've I've prepared a some few a few slides here. Uh, you can you can go ahead and add my screen in here. Uh, I prepared a few slides as well as I'll exit out of here and we can pull some code up on the screen as well too. So I will kick this off. Not that one. That is the presenter view. This one. 
There we go. Okay. <laughs> so I already did an intro on myself. We don't need to do that again. Today, I'm going to talk about Next.js, what it is, why it exists, and how you can start using it in your application. And uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to keep things brief and make sure we have time for questions at the end too. And please let me know in the chat if there's parts that you want me to go in deeper on or give uh, a higher level explanation of. So first and foremost, what is Next.js? Next.js is a full stack React framework for the web. And there's a couple pieces to dissect here. Full stack, React framework, and web. So like I, I mentioned, React is probably the most popular way of building on the web today. It allows you to really easily declaratively build these pieces of your UI, of your user interface. Next.js is a framework on top of React that makes it easy to build large websites and web applications. So it's focused on the web. It's not really focused on mobile or embedded systems right now. <laughs> right now, you never know. Maybe it's a Next.js uh, operating system in the future. But at least for today, <laughs> we're focused on the web. And it's full stack. There is both the ability to write client and server-side code, as well as APIs. And we'll get into that a little bit more. So before I jump in, I'm going to reel it back just a little bit and talk about some of the foundations that make up the web so that we're all on the same page and we'll progress from HTML to React to Next.js. So first and foremost, the web. It's made up of a collection of documents. These HTML files express some tags like headers or lists or divs, and they ultimately make up this DOM, this document object model, which is this graph-like or tree representation of your code. And then your browser, you know, your Chromium engine, your Chrome browser, your Firefox or Safari, these browsers then turn this into some pixels on the screen, some UI showing your headers and your, your lists, for example. And this is the basis of how these documents are distributed on the web. Now, when you look at a website, you don't necessarily think in documents, though. At least for me, when I look at a site, I think in reusable components. I look and I see, well, there's the logo, or there's the navigation bar, there's the address, or there's the form. And when you try to do this with vanilla JavaScript, uh, it looks something like this. So you want to build a UI on the fly using JavaScript. So let's say I have a, a div here that's called app. And I use a just a vanilla script tag inside of my HTML. I'm going to grab that element, line five. I'm going to create a new H1. I'm going to throw some text in there. And then I'm going to append it to that element. This is basically the super, super simplified version of kind of what React is doing. And when you look at what this actually materializes to, on the right, I wrote some HTML that had a script. And it dynamically kind of rendered this DOM on the left that shows the H1 of the develop preview ship. So fundamentally, in like extremely simplified version, this is what React is giving to you. It allows you to render, <laughs> it allows you to render out some H1, for example, with some string or some sub components into a, uh, a DOM element on the screen in this example app. Now, here's where this gets tricky. Imagine we have this big HTML file. This really isn't that big. It's only 37 lines, but hear me out. You have a really large HTML file. This is the kind of more verbose version of the diagram I had earlier. There's a logo, there's a nav, there's an address, there's a form. You really want to write something that looks a little bit more like this. Like there's a line 11 logo, line 12 nav bar. Like you're trying to compartmentalize or componentize these things. And this becomes increasingly important when you have multiple pages. You got a home page, you got an about page. Both of these have a nav bar. If I'm just dealing with you know, vanilla HTML documents, uh, it's harder to reuse or share code across those documents. You really want to have the nav bar component. And just, just to clarify, the code you're looking at here is not valid HTML. This is like a pseudo component in there with the, the logo or nav bar. What you really want to do is you want to write things as components and as JavaScript. This is the magic. And I think why React became so popular is 
it's you know quote unquote just JavaScript. You you write your component with JavaScript functions. You return some HTML like code. It's actually called JSX, but it, you know it functionally looks a lot like HTML. And then React is able to do the magic and actually put the pixels on the screen and render this out. So you're able to think in this mental model of components and be able to construct your UI in a very declarative. Uh, developer-friendly way of writing and reusing code. Now, components are amazing because components are not only uh, like a header or a nav bar, but they're things like images or pockets of text or buttons. And this is not only code that you write yourself, this is this vast ecosystem of components on NPM or the Node Package Manager Registry um, which you can basically NPM install React hyphen anything and get access to this vast ecosystem of things that other developers have helped build and open source. And these components can be pretty complex and pretty useful. So for example, if I have a button component, this isn't just a, a read only point in time component. React can accept props, short for properties, that allow you to modify different pieces of that component. So maybe you want to have a prop for primary or secondary or disabled, and you're able to create these permutations or different versions of your component. And it's not just props too, it's also state. Components can have their own internal state. Maybe it's managing whether something is flipped on or off, like a Boolean state, or maybe it's incrementing some sort of likes counter. This state can be um, componentized and placed individually close to your React components. And again, this isn't necessarily just in your own application. This could be shared across the entire ecosystem of components you can kind of download and reuse. Now, this is where Next.js comes into the picture. Everything I've talked about up till now is just basic HTML and the foundations of React. Next.js is taking this and building a layer on top. So going back to the start, I mentioned a full stack React framework for the web. Now, the reason it's full stack and the reason it's a framework is because it's providing both the client and the server. So the, in the Next.js uh, bit here, you're actually creating this UI with the underlying React um, logic that we just talked about, the underlying React rendering engine. But Next.js is also helping you do some of the hard parts about building websites and web applications, like routing between pages or fetching data from your database or your content management system or your e-commerce store like Shopify or allowing your users to log in or connect to their wallet or you know, read from um, you know, some external location. Next.js is giving you the primitives to help make it possible to do that. And fundamentally, it's just giving you everything pre-configured to build high-performance web applications. So to help explain, um, this, this is almost like the, maybe not the 101, but the 201, but just to peel back the, the layer of the onion here a bit and help you understand what Next.js is doing under the hood from when you write code and it actually gets rendered out in your browser. I'm going to walk you through a couple steps and then we'll actually pull up some code and, and start talking about some of the fun stuff. So on the left, you want to write code that looks like this. It's a JavaScript function. It's a React component. It renders out some HTML-like stuff, which is JSX. In this instance, just a div. But the browser doesn't know how to handle this, right? The browser is like, I don't know. I don't know how I handle that. So this is where compilers come into the mix. Your compiler, in this instance, the most popular one is called Babel. Next.js uses that, as well as the newer versions use one called SWC, which uses Rust, so it's a little bit faster. Your compiler takes this code and transforms it into this version that the browser can understand. So you write your React code, it gets compiled, the browser can understand it. Then that compiled code, you know, it, it's still more or less human readable, right? Kind of. I mean, I, I personally would never want to write code like that, right? That's why we have these tools and we have this build chain that makes it easy for us to write uh, pretty looking code and have the browser just take in the raw stuff. The minifier then takes this compiled code and removes everything that's unnecessary. It strips out all the white space and just trims it down into the smallest possible file size to help you get the fastest page loads. So you've got this compiled minified code and 
The next step is your bundler, your webpack of the world, which some of you might be familiar with, um, or other types of bundlers. They say, hey, I've got this file. I've got this JavaScript file. It's a component. And not only is it pulling in my navigation bar component, it's kind of composing these things together. They also imported uh, date functions or some external library from NPM so that they could render dates better. Like it's, you're probably not going to write every single bit of code in your application yourself. You're going to take advantage of the NPM ecosystem. So your bundler is able to say, hey, let's go trace all of these dependencies. We're going to build a nice graph of how all these things stitch together in some like galaxy brain stuff and then st stitch it back together essentially and pull only the code that you need to generate these final JavaScript bundles. Um, now, a key thing here, this is a, a 201 thing, but let's say you have a massive NPM file, but you only use one small little function. If your uh, libraries are configured correctly, there's this buzzword or this keyword called tree shaking, which means that you're able to only use the code that you actually define that one function and your bundler will strip away all the extra stuff. So smaller file size, faster page load. So you get this bundled file and then Next.js is able to say, hey, when I load the about page, I only want to load the code for the about page. Let's break down that bundle into smaller pieces or smaller chunks. This process is called code splitting. So I go to the about page, I'm only loading the smallest amount of code that's possible and if there's some bit of code that's kind of reused or shared across multiple pages, let's load that too. Like really all these like small lower level optimizations that are just helping you write code that looks like this on the left, just a small component here. And next you just go through all these steps to help make it really, really fast. So you get your code, you get your, uh, your code split um, outputs, you get these smaller JavaScript files. And Next.js is able to run these and serve them up because it includes a server. Now you have customers potentially or visitors all around the world who want to get these files sent to them as quickly as possible. So by default, you could you know, put your, your Next.js server on uh, like a DigitalOcean server somewhere, for example, and just throw it on a $5 a month server and just kind of let it run. That's great. Another option too is that you can deploy to Vercel, which is where I work, and the creators of Next.js, which then takes the, all of those generated files and places them all around the world close to where your visitors are at to help make the performance just a little bit better. Now, Next.js includes a lot of optimizations to help your application be as fast as possible. You want to get those 100 Google Lighthouse scores. You want it to be fast for your visitors. One of those is images. Images are notoriously hard to do right. Uh, and you know, surprisingly, the web is made up of basically text and images. That's the majority of what the documents make up. So loading these images efficiently is very important. So we include an image component, which helps you not only size your images correctly, but also optimize images on the fly to get the smallest file size, the fastest loads, and use the latest supported features from whatever browser your visitor is in. We also have font optimization, which will be getting better here in the future as well too, that lets you write code that includes fonts from like a Google APIs or a Google fonts, for example, in this instance, enter. Next.js will automatically do this magic to make it fast, give you a link that pre-connects to it and inlines this to a font face, this is all kind of advanced, but basically the, the TLDR is it's helping make it fast for you to load and use custom web fonts on the web because you want to have these cool looking fonts. You want it to look, uh, you want it to look unique. Uh, and, and the final one I'll talk about here is scripts. So uh, loading external scripts or third-party scripts is such a critical part of building larger web applications, whether it's, you know, you want to add analytics or you want to add um, you know, like cookie banners and the tools to handle that. You want to do A-B testing. You want to load in uh, uh, some external library for um, uh, an SDK you want to use. You want to do like Algolia for searching. Like the list goes on. There's lots of cool things you can do, but loading scripts correctly can have, or incorrectly can have a, a negative impact on your performance. So the script component allows you to have a couple different strategies for how you want to load scripts. And by default, we'll try to help you get the best 
performance for your application. Those are the only slides I have. Now I wanna jump into code, but before I jump into code, I wanna take the opportunity to step through some of the comments and just see if there's if there's anything here you want me to, to go in a little bit further on before I, I go in. So I do see one person here asking about Re React as a library. And I think this is a, it's a, uh, a, a tricky naming situation where some people call React a library. Some people call React a framework. Some people call Next.js a framework. Some people call Next.js a meta framework. The way I like to think about it is that React is giving you the building blocks. It's giving you the Lego components that you can stitch together, expressed by you know, an individual React component. Next.js being a framework is a higher order system that's giving you not only the underlying rendering layer of React, but also the things like the image and font and script optimizations that are helping you make your website fast. Uh, I see somebody here likes the image component. Also, um, check out the new next future image component, which will be uh, becoming stable and uh, here soon-ish. Um, slides available afterward? Yes, I'm happy to make, um, it looks like it'll be posted on the Discord along with the, the recording. Uh, <laughs> I see somebody asking about, yeah, in 2016, when, uh, when folks were learning Webpack, I, I know that I, I was also uh, a bit overwhelmed when I first learned Webpack. There's just lots of uh, configuration options and lots of ways that things can go wrong. So the fact that it's now integrated into these tools like uh, like a Next.js or you know like other similar tools like a Create React app makes it really easy for folks to get started without having to dig into the 201 or the 301 level classes and uh, debug their applications. Um, I'm glad that folks are enjoying this. I think I don't see any other uh, immediately immediate questions right now, so I think I'll just I think I will just jump into the code. Let's. Let's do that now. Okay, so hopefully my font size is big enough. I, I've done this enough times now where I just, you know, I make it aggressively large, just as large as you possibly can go. So what I did is I ran uh, create next app, uh, MPX create next app, which what this is gonna do is it will download the hello world or the starter kit application for your next application. NPX is this special command that Node.js uses that allows you to kind of download some code. So the prerequisite here is that you have Node.js installed. Um, you can go to, I think it's nodejs.org or similar and download a version of Node. In this instance, I'm using uh, Node 16, which I believe includes MPX by default. So I'm able to download this code and get it running. In this instance, we're using Yarn, which is the package manager of choice, but you know, you can use whatever you want. And you know, if I run yarn, all of my dependencies are installed in my node modules folder. So let's just take a quick peek inside this package JSON. What do we get with the standard Hello World application? Well, we get a few scripts to run our application. We get a few dependencies and a few dev dependencies. So with these scripts, we're able to, you know, one, run yarn dev to start our application on our local server. So it's over here on the right. Um, let me... Let me actually make this show the toolbar so you can see my local host over here. So I've got this running at localhost 3000, which if any of you have used Next.js before, we now have dark mode on the starter, which is a nice, <laughs> a nice little touch. Um, so this is running on my local machine now. I reload the page and I, I see the new route. Uh, I can build my application when I'm ready to go to production. I can start the production server or I can actually have this integrated ESLint system to essentially help me if I've written code that um, you know could perform badly or could cause errors in my application. Now, Next.js is built on React, so you're able to specify which version of React you want here. And then, like I mentioned, we're using ESLint to provide that built-in assistance for uh, kind of running your application. So let's actually dive in and take a look at the page that you're looking at right now. So my, my application is running locally with Yarn Dev. I go to pages slash index. This is the entry into our application. So Next.js has this file system based router where when I go to localhost slash 3000, it just maps back to this index file. So if I go in here and actually change this code, 
Hit save. You just see it automatically updates here on the right side of the browser in you know, a small number of milliseconds without me having to actually hit refresh in the browser. This is called fast refresh, and it's very addictive. Once you get used to this, it's, it's hard to go back to having to manually hit refresh every time. It just makes it very easy for you to kind of make changes, save, and iterate, iterate and just see them uh, happen really fast. So we're in this pages index file. We can make changes and see them updated immediately. Now, one of the things I talked about uh, in the slides were, you know, it'd be great if we could share some of these components across multiple files or multiple routes. So what I'll do is I'll actually just copy paste this. I'll go to pages and I'll make a new file about.js. And I'll just paste this in and you know what? I'll just get rid of like a bunch of stuff in here. Just uh, in this may or in this H1, we'll do about and we'll change this to about. We're not using the image. Hit save. Now, if I go over into my browser and I go to slash about, we see the about page. So this is a really interesting part about Next.js built-in file system routing is that you just make new files and then they're automatically wrap or automatically routed to the actual accessible URLs in your application uh, without you having to kind of stitch together any of the configuration for that. And again, this is just automatically updating if I want to make any changes without me having to hit save in it or anything. So let's say I wanted to you know, share some code between these two. Uh, I could you know, go out here and maybe make a new folder and say components, for example. And we'll make a new, we'll make a new component. We'll call this uh, header. And we'll do uh, export default function header. And we'll do um, actually do header, maybe nav. And we'll do uh, unordered list. Let's see if GitHub Copilot's going to just give me some amazing stuff here. We got a link. We got a about. Yeah. <laughs> and I can hit save and prettier, which if you don't have prettier installed, you should definitely check it out. Just auto format your code, which is really nice. Uh, I have a header, I have a navigation, unordered list with some uh, links to home, links to about. And you see it's using this capital L link, but I'm not actually importing this anywhere. And this is another built-in component of Next.js that I actually didn't talk about in the slides, but we can do that here, which is the link component. And what this does is it makes page transitions or routes between the different pages really, really fast. So we have home, we have about, I think this looks good. Let's actually close out of this and we'll close out of this. We'll go back into our index route. Let's say we wanna put this header, we'll put it right here. Um, let's see if my, I call it header. I'm just if my, yeah, I did call it header. Will my VS code automatically pick it up? It will, yay. So, um, oh, another thing I guess I did mention about React is like this, this thing here, this is actually a self-closing tag. I guess this is more of a, uh, an HTML thing, but I have a self-closing tag on this component. So I have this imported header component from components here, and then I'm using it inside of my index route. And now you see back over here, I have this unordered, lit, you know, <laughs> it's not styled the greatest, but we'll do that next. Uh, I have home and I have about, and when I transition between these two, you see it's really fast. Now, my whole point earlier was I want to be able to write code like header and I want to be able to reuse it in multiple places. So let's go and do about, for example, and let's also put this in here. And, you know, maybe we actually abstract this out into a shared wrapper, for example. But at least for now, this just demonstrates the, the purpose of now I have this shared header and navigating between the between these two routes is really fast, which is awesome. So, okay, this looks good. What if I want to actually make some changes to the styling? Well, if I go to this magic underscore app folder, this is essentially the shared layout for my entire application. Now I'm gonna give one big caveat to this whole thing, which is this is changing somewhat soon. So we have this layouts RFC. 
that has uh, kind of the plan for how we're going to change up routing inside of Next.js. I'd recommend checking this out. It goes very in depth and all this stuff. The, the high level summary is that there will be an app folder instead of the pages folder that you can kind of incrementally move to. So don't feel like you're behind if you're starting today using the pages folder, it's totally okay. It will still be supported. But going forward in this new uh, layouts RFC world, there actually won't be an underscore app. There will be a root layout. But that's for another day, at least for today. Let's talk through underscore app. You see that it imports this global style sheet. So if we go to our styles folder, we see global here. These are styles that apply to the entire application. So for example, if I wanted to add, you know, 64 pixels of margin on the entire HTML and the entire body, I can do that here. In this instance, I don't want to, but notice that even changing styles automatically hot reloads or re refreshes my code without me having to reload the browser. So it's not just my React components. But then I also had in the index, I had this styles import here for .module.css. And these files are specific to this folder. These are called CSS modules and they're different from global styles because the styles imported here in this file and in this CSS module are only going to be included in the pages that import them. So this allows you to keep your CSS files smaller by only defining code that is used for the page and it helps prevent naming collisions. So naming collisions would be like if I went in my globals and I defined a new class, I'm, I'm sure we've all done this before. You make a class and it's like nav bar. <laughs> now anywhere in your application, uh, look at Copilot's really just gonna help me out here. I actually don't have to write code anymore. I'm just a, I'm a, I'm a robot. I'm a cyborg actually, uh, nav bar. And I define a, a class like this. Now, anywhere in my application that I try to use nav bar, the global CSS namespace has been, you know, quote unquote polluted with this nav bar. This is where you get into the world where people are like, you know, <laughs> nav bar, newer, uh, please override uh, specificity. You know what I mean? So that's what CSS modules help solve, which is making it so that if I'm in home, I can use this footer inside home and I import styles here and I use styles.footer and it helps prevent those naming collisions. So let's actually add some styles to our, uh, our navigation items here. So I'll make a new CSS module. We'll call this uh, header dot module dot CSS. Uh, what do we have here for the, for the instance of, you know, let's do uh, just the nav bar. Maybe we could reuse those styles we, we created earlier. So we'll do uh, dot nav bar. Will copilot help? Yep. Cool. I'm just going to use these and we'll just see, we'll see what they have. So we got nav bar. Now I go into my header. And on the nav, I'm going to do a new class name. We're going to do styles dot, oh, that's not what I want. Styles dot, uh, I think it was nav bar. Was it nav bar? Yeah. And then I want to import styles from styles header module CSS. That looks good to me. I hit save. Um, yeah, I think that worked, but it didn't didn't really do much. So let's do um, let's do I'm trying to think of what the uh, I think it's list style. I'm trying to think of the one that uh, removes the dots. Well, this isn't this is on the nav bar, so we need to go to the unordered list to do that. I'm just trying to do something that's actually. <laughs> Actually, I'll just what what what's Copilot gonna give me? Maybe it'll give me something good. I don't know. Maybe maybe not. I don't know. Um. Anyways, that's basically how you do styles, and that's how you uh, make them work with CSS modules. Boom! There's a ton of padding. Um. The next thing I want to talk about is API routes. So I mentioned that Next.js is 
enabling you to make full stack applications. So if I go into this magical little pages folder here, I see this API folder and I see hello.js. Now this allows you to write code that looks like uh, kind of like Express.js if you've ever used that before. Uh, and it automatically maps to your file system. So if I do localhost slash 3000 slash API slash hello, I get back a JSON response, which is pretty cool. I didn't have to set up anything special for this. And I'm able to get um, you know, a JSON object back from my server. So inside of here, I could do all sorts of fun stuff. I could, let, let's put uh, Copilot to the test again. I'll do uh, const request equals await fetch, okay, uh, GitHub API, sure. Um, we're gonna get some JSON data back and it's gonna tell me it wants to return that JSON data. Not really sure if this is gonna work. The uh, GitHub API is, you can use it unauthenticated, so we can try it. Uh, and since we used await here, which is telling us that we want to pause for some uh, asynchronous code, we need to mark this function as async. Um, so yeah, we're gonna make an API call, we're gonna get some data back and we're gonna return it. Don't know if it's gonna work, we're gonna find out. It works, ah, go pilot. <laughs> Saves the day. Uh, so we got back some JSON information about our cell, about how many repos we have, 111, um, some stars that we have, the ID, all this cool stuff. So this is neat because this goes into our question about how can we use environment variables with Next.js. So let's give a little bit of demo of that. If I go over to our application in the root of our application and I make a new .env folder, I could do something like uh, my underscore secret equals, you know, yep, that's my secret. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, <laughs> I can define some environment variables here and I'm able to now use these inside of places in my application. So for example, I'll just close out of all this other stuff. In my API route, let's say, uh, you know, I'm not actually gonna use it here to do anything with it, but we could just return um, secret is process.env, which is how you access those files, uh, my underscore secrets and reload. And we get our secret value. Now, this means that you don't have to write, you know, let's say this actually was something secret. You don't have to write, oh no, this is my secret, and then commit this into Git, which would be bad because then anybody who is looking at your application would be able to see this value. So with the uh, environment files, you can, you know, put it as an environment variable here. And then when you deploy it, for example, to Vercel, you can just add these into your Vercel account and you don't have to actually expose these anywhere in your source code. Um, so that's that. Also, recent fun fact, um, a recent addition to Next.js was hot reloading for environment variables. So if you see the, the server just restarted here uh, and now I re refresh the page and I get the, the new environment variable. So that didn't used to actually happen. Uh, shout out to the Next.js team for adding that feature in. Um, the other thing I wanna talk about, these are only available on the server. So if I go back to localhost 3000, uh, and if I were to go in here, for example, and actually I'm just gonna revert all the way back to here, just to, to what we had at the start, because it had, well, I guess it already had this code block, but we're gonna keep this code block. <laughs> and inside of here, we're going to do um, process.env.my underscore secret. This isn't gonna work because this value is not available. I could even do um, if this is undefined. So, or, um, nah. <laughs> so this value is undefined and we get back, nah. But if I wanted to expose this to the client side, I could do next underscore public underscore my secret next underscore public underscore my secret, save, hit save. 
And now we get our value. So now we tell Next.js, hey, you want to expose this value to the client, to the browser. It's maybe a secret that has scope down permissions, for example. So that is very helpful. And uh, I think those are the main things that I wanted to cover. Um, the only other thing I want to cover is there's this public folder that's included, which uh, allows you to put in essentially any static file and serve it up from the Next.js server. And again, this is mapped to the file system. So if I go to localhost slash 3000 slash vercel.svg, I'm actually going to serve up this file from this folder. So I could drop any image or text file or, or basically anything that I want in here and be able to access it. Um, the other thing I was going to show actually was just to walk through um, what the scripts look like. So when I run yarn build, for example, this is doing that production build and optimizing my application. So it's doing the comp compilation and the minification and the bundling and the code splitting, like making all these chunks, walking through that entire pipeline to essentially allow you to be able to do, you know, yarn start, which is what, for example, like uh, Vercel will do is it starts up your application. And now we're not running the development version anymore. We're running the production version. So when I reload, I'm seeing this production version. For example, if I were to go over here and you know change this code to something else, I hit save, you don't see it updated because it's not hot reloading a local server anymore. We've taken our code, we've bundled it, compiled it, we've built these assets, we've generated it into this .next folder, which is where the, the generated output goes here. And then we start the production server looking at that generated code. So that's how that works. Uh, and the final thing here is uh, yarn lint, which I should probably revert this back. Um, yarn lint, which runs ES lint integrated across our application. So it's saying, hey, there's no ES lint warnings or errors. Um, I think if I did something like this is just wrong. <laughs> it's, this is just not accurate. Uh, maybe, I don't know if this, this isn't really actually an ES lit error. This is just uh, incorrect code, but maybe, oh yeah. It still tells me that something is wrong. So it's not able to parse uh, this missing semicolon. Obviously there's a bunch of included rules here that help you write great React code, accessible code, um, and help you uh, get great performance. But this is just a basic example of, of what a failure would look like. Um, yeah, I think the last thing to do here might be to actually um, take this code and deploy it out to the world. What do, what do you all think about that? I think we should do it. Uh, we're gonna run Vercel, which you can do uh, npm i-g slash Vercel, which installs the Vercel CLI. And then you could actually um, you know, link or create your first uh, Vercel account. So I'm just going to deploy this to my account. There's not a new project. And let's just, let's send this thing out. So we're going to deploy our application. And while this is deploying out to the world, I'll check the chat and see what y'all think. Uh, what is the best way to use Vercel, which has a tool for environment variables? That's a great question, and I can actually demo this right now. So if I go to Vercel and I go to this newly created project here, um, you see it actually kicked off this deployment. Um, I can see it's actually building right now. It's about 30 seconds in. If I go to settings and I go to environment variables, let's pull this over here. This is where I can actually add those values from earlier. So Oh, by the way, uh, our application is deployed. So here is the new value. Woo, amazing. Now, in reality, um, you probably wouldn't commit or include these secrets inside of .env. You know, maybe you can if it's like a Google Analytics uh, project ID or something like that. But... If you don't want to do this and you want to use them inside of Vercel, you could say, um, 
know, we could actually try doing this one, for example. Ooh. Um, you do this and we're going to apply it to all environments, both production, preview. I can talk about this more if you want. Also development, uh, kind of add this in here and then I'll just go to my code. I'll just delete this value. So we no longer have a .env and I'll do uh, another deployment here while we're while we're waiting. So now this deployment is going to say, hey, you added an environment variable that has some special value on Vercel. Let's use that instead. Um, and this works pretty much like how you would expect. Um, we're going to see this new deployment kicked off here. Um, we can actually go in and look at the build logs and kind of see the same next build command that I just showed on my local machine uh, and you know see that, oh, hey, look, our our deployment completed, it's gonna you know, put this in the cache. We have 21 static files. We have one API that uses a serverless function. And you know, in about 24 seconds, we're done. And yeah, spoiler, you can see in the, uh, the preview that it used the new value, but now we see the wow. And we see this environment variable that's pulled specifically from for cell. So that's kind of how the, the workflow goes from developing on your local machine to actually shipping some code out to the browser. Um, I see some I see some fire emojis in the chat. I see some people <laughs> impressed by it. Yeah, that's really the beauty of it. You can you can do it directly from the command line, which you know makes it really easy to do. Or, you know, if you want, you can kind of push this up to a Git repository and just automatically get um, automatically get a PR um, or a, a link generated on each PR for your code. Um, let me check and see if there's any questions. Otherwise, I can actually show that as well too. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can deploy. <laughs> I see someone saying, wait, you can deploy from the command line? Yeah, you can absolutely deploy from the command line. I think some people do this. Um, some people also prefer to do uh, from GitHub. So for example, if I make a new repository, you know, say do this. We'll do uh, Lee, create repository. I don't, yeah, I think this has, when you do create next app, it creates a new Git folder and it instantiates a new Git project. So I have this code here. Um, so I have an existing repository. I just need to add this remote, which is the origin here. So I can, oops. Uh, I can paste this in here, which adds the remote, changes to the main branch, and it kind of pushes all my code up to the origin. I also have some other code here. So I can say stuff from the demo. Um, pro tip, command enter in VS Code from here will commit. And then command shift P, you can do git push to origin. And now if I refresh my page over here, I'm able to see all this code that I just made. So now, actually, what I could do, just for, for the sake of the demo, I can go to vercel.com slash new. And I'm going to pick my Lerob project. So I see this uh, WBW3 here. I can click import. And this is going to use that code that is coming from this folder, for example. So I can just kind of hit deploy here. And this is actually going to make a new project. If I wanted to, I could... Um, if I wanted to, I could go out and just connect this existing project to my Git repo, which you can do in, in your settings here if you want. Or, you know, I could go out and actually create a new deployment. Either way, the cool thing here is that let's say I'm, I don't want to use the CLI and I instead want to use, uh, I instead want to make some changes on my local machine. You can have this uh, workflow of, again, uh, command shift P. Let's create a branch and say demo. And then we'll go to this index file and we'll say, hey, this is new stuff. And hit save. You see that we can see our chain. By the way, I've just gotten so used to using Git inside VS Code. It's, it's a really good workflow for me, but other people might prefer to use you know, a different Git client. But uh, oh yeah, back over here in this tab, we just deployed um, our new version of our project which is here, which is cool. Um, and you know, it's funny is that in this new project, we don't have the environment variable set. So we see, <laughs> we see the old version here, which is the fallback if it's undefined. Um, 
So this is now actually hooked up to this project. So if I go over here and I make this commit where I change some code, uh, command, uh, command enter, command shift P, we're gonna push it to the demo branch. I go back over here, GitHub says, hey, you just pushed some code. You wanna make a pull request? Why, yes, I would love to make a code or, uh, pull request. I create a pull request. This is like a pretty common workflow, I think, for people versus um, just using a command line locally. But, you know, you can do whatever you want. And the Vercel, uh, the bots who are working hard at your service, comment on the PR and say, hey, you've connected this to GitHub. Do you want to just automatically make new deployments? And we say, okay, yeah, let's do that. So I made a couple changes here. Hey, this is some new stuff. And it says, let's go check that out. And you see the new version of your code live on the internet. Hey, this is some new stuff. Now, if you say, okay, all of this looks great. I love these changes. You know, you could approve it or somebody else could approve it. And I go in here and I, I merge this code into our main branch, for example. Then let's go back over to here. Then it automatically kicks off a new production deployment of our application. This gets into the concept of environments. We want to talk about it a little bit more, but uh, initially we made our first production deployment. We saw a preview deployment when we opened up that new branch. So we were previewing some changes to make sure we liked it. And then in about 16 seconds, we merge it back into production and we see our new version of the site here, which says, hey, this is some new stuff. That's the workflow, folks. That's how easy it is to actually take your code and get it deployed on the internet. And that's, that's all I have today. Um, if you have more questions, I would absolutely, absolutely love to answer them. Um, but for now, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, yeah, just see, see what people think. Thank you so much for, for joining in everybody. I, I really appreciate dropping by and hanging out. <laughs> Yay, OMG, everyone is literally hyping you up in the comments right now. And honestly, as they should. So let's do our Lee and Next.js love bomb. Um, everyone here is like loving your teaching. I have gotten to watch Lee speak at a conference once Thank before. You. So this is only my second time really watching him like full for an hour. And I was telling everyone in our Discord, I'm like, We've had maybe five or six workshops so far, and they were all great, but this is definitely not one to miss. Um, and for everyone watching, the kudos link is attached to the description now. I just updated it, so you might have to refresh, um, but now it's in there so you can claim your kudos for joining here. Somebody take a screenshot of all the hearts, because I have a weird view in StreamYard so that you can, <laughs> so I can have that picture later. And um, as always, working in DevRel, it's always great to leave a talk and get off stage and open Twitter and see so many people like talking about how great the talk was. So here, I'll remove this banner. There you can find Lee's handle in case you want to tweet him, at him what you learned, what was your favorite part about this workshop. And Lee, where can people go if they have questions about building on Next.js? Like if they leave here and they're like, okay, I'm going to work on this project, where should they go when they have questions? Yeah, so a much longer version of some of the concepts I talked about today is available at nextjs.org slash learn, as well as a way more in-depth version of kind of building your first application and, and uh, some of the things you can use. That's a self-guided tutorial if folks want to run through it. Uh, if you have questions about Next.js, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter at Next.js or at Purcell, or you can tweet at me as well too. Um, my, my Twitter is on the screen here at, at Lee Rob, or you can go to my website, leerob.io. And uh, yeah, feel free to, to send me any questions. I'm happy to help. Oh yeah. Speaking of your website, I totally, uh, when I was making my own personal website, I was like, who has the best personal website out there so I can copy them? And Lee was actually <laughs> the ones who I copied. So yeah. So let me just show you his real quick. It's actually so cute and so good. How do I share my screen? Share. Uh, I've been working on a new version too. So oh, really? I'm, okay, yeah. It's I'm excited. I, I'm really happy with the one that I have now, but I always, just for fun, I, I enjoy just changing things up and adding new features. And uh, my code's all open source as well too, if people want to check it out. It's a Next.js and Vercel site. Um, 
just showing off some some cool stuff like working with databases and uh yeah okay so this is lee's where is it this is lee's there it is and then i kind of stole his i love this vibe i make you know i mean maybe people don't know but i make a lot of technical content on tiktok and i love this little idea of like highlighting the, mm -hmm. the best things that you have right there so I think I even took out, there used to be a picture of me here. It used to look a lot more identical to yours. So <laughs> I don't even think I ever told you. So thank you. And also the other cool thing, I think people are kind of through this course, hopefully are starting to realize that. But if you go to Lee Rob and here, so here's the website that he was just talking about. So what you can yep. do is if you like it, you can make a fork, which is what I did. You see 756 people also have done that. You make a fork. And it'll basically give you a copy, an exact copy of what the code he has up there. And then you can rename this and then you can make edits to it. So say, you know, maybe you don't like this rainbow or you can even restructure this front page and keep kind of the spirit of it. So it's a really easy way to get started building your own personal website. It's just forking leads, honestly. That would be my, yeah. <laughs> if someone were to ask me like, what's the best way to build a personal website? It'd be like fork leads. Yeah, and there's um, also, there's two videos in the readme um, if you want to watch me just walk through the code at the different stages uh, in, in its life. So at one point, it was kind of all markdown files uh, in the code. I did a stream on it. And then another time, it was a little bit different. And you can look at the code at that point. And then today, I'm actually using a CMS. I'm using Sanity. So there, there's levels of complexity that you can or can not jump into. If you want, you can delete all that stuff and just, you know, just use the homepage if you'd like or use some of the styles. So, Yeah. There's, there's levels to this shit, basically. <laughs> Period. I didn't want to say shit on the banner, but that's what I was saying. There's levels to this shit, okay? You can start easy mode. Lee's playing the game on expert mode right now. A lot of us are playing the game on easy mode, including myself. So like you said, there's levels. So don't feel like you have to go all crazy with stuff that you don't understand. You can start with like a more simple iteration and then work your way up to using a CMS, learning what a CMS, how you actually integrate it with an app. But anyways, we've reached our hour. Thank you so much, Lee. You are literally the best. And thanks for having I'll just me. Leave this up for people to exit out. And yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. Lee is like super huge and busy and speak keynotes, conferences, international conferences. So the fact that he's here giving us basically a private workshop is like super amazing. And this is going to be recorded, so we'll, we'll post this on YouTube so everyone else can watch it too. And Any all right. Time. Thanks Anytime. Always me. happy to, to help. And I love the, the community of folks that you have here. All, all of y'all are wonderful, doing amazing things. And yeah, you can start small with one small component, one small page. Definitely don't need to make anything that looks like the, the site where it ended up. And that's, that's how we learn and that's how we grow together. So yeah. Okay. Thanks everyone. We're going to awesome. go out now. Thanks Lee. Bye. See ya. Bye.